Hi, it's Jan Beta, and as you can probably see in the background, it's a particularly rainy summer day or summer day here in Germany. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to do some work on the Amiga 600 that I didn't look at for a while, uh, which is kind of a bummer because I love this machine. Got donated by Katrina a while back and I already did two videos about this machine. Uh, one where I fixed a capacitor issue that prevented it from starting up. A uh, capacitor in the reset circuitry was broken. And then I did a second one which is like a walkthrough of um, replacing all the electrolytic capacitors in this one. Because these have the uh, early to mid 90s variant of electrolytic surface mount capacitors that are very prone to leakage and failure. And uh, yeah, they basically destroy, by leaking on the circuit board, they basically eat away the circuit board slowly. So if you have one of these, I uh, highly recommend getting it recapped or recapping it yourself. You can watch my video. It's not that hard to do if you have the right tools and a lot of patience basically. So uh, do that. Sooner or later you're going to regret not doing it even if the machine works and seems to be fine. If it works, it's not, it's not a sign that everything's all right with the machine basically. Uh, yeah, what I want to do today is to put an IDE to SD card solution in here and install the workbench and I'm also going to do some work on the case and I think uh, this is not it's not very bad on this one but it has yellowed some of the keys particularly in this uh, lower region of the keyboard are a bit yellowed um, I want to do some retro writing on it and clean it up properly and I think I also need to repair the case a bit because some of the hinges this has hinges on the sides and along the perimeter basically that are very easy to break off which I think happened on some of the hinges if I remember correctly. I didn't look into this uh, for quite a while so I don't really remember it but I need to clean up the case and do some retro brighting on this so that's the plan for today and yeah we're going to see what else I encounter. Usually if you get into something like this uh, you encounter more problems on the way. <laughs> so let's just go. Let me take some seconds to thank my sponsor for this video, PCBWay, who are a manufacturer of prototype PCBs and larger projects. And they have their sixth anniversary coming up. So there are going to be some festivities going on on the website and larger coupons and such are waiting for the anniversary, so I recommend checking them out. So the very first step obviously is to open this up again and uh, take a look. This is actually quite a weird construction. <laughs> Not particularly a fan of the Amiga 600 case. It has all kinds of hinges on the sides. I do have to loosen, I'm just using my fingernails here. This is like the bracket for where the hard disk originally sit, sits. I left it in because it also uh, acts as a support for the keyboard. I think this had an IDE uh, to compact flash adapter in it originally when I got it, uh, before I got it actually, when Katrina got it, before she donated it. It had a CF card sitting on here, that's why there's uh, some gaffer's tape on here. <laughs> and yeah, we can just pull this off, it's just, there's some indentations in the PCB. To get the keyboard out you just lift this connector up, the bracket on the connector and you can just carefully pull out the keyboard ribbon. These are really prone to failure uh, so if you encounter an Amiga 600 or 1200 which has the same mechanism um, with a broken or only half working keyboard chances are it's just this connector not making good connection anymore or broken traces in the connector. Most of the times it's just these uh, I think it's carbon 
it's just printed on this connector that is uh, dirty or rubbed off or anything like that. Um, there's a way to just cut this a bit or I've seen people just sticking a, a piece of uh, paper behind it, like here, to um, push the contacts against the contacts in the connector on the PCB. Sometimes that helps. Um, can cut a piece of it off so it makes contact again because the uh, carbon is better. <laughs> so yeah, there's different ways. I think you can also get new membranes for these keyboards altogether which have a new connector on it these days. So that is another option to fix this. This particular one also comes with a kickstart switcher which has, I, I need to connect a different uh, switch here anyway, because this is a three-way switch. The middle position doesn't have anything uh, connected to it, I think. So, yeah, it's kind of pointless to have this. And it's also a rather large switch. I, I think I have something smaller that's more suitable for the job uh, sitting in my parts bin somewhere. So we're going to see about that too. Uh, I'm going to have to remove this to get the circuit board out of the case because I want to give the case a good cleaning. I need to re remove the RAM expansion, which is actually a broken RAM expansion. We could have a look at that too. Maybe that's going to be a separate video. Probably. Um, yeah, this had, had some battery leakage. That's why it looks so peculiar. I think somebody tried to repair it before. The previous owner probably. If you look closely here is a little, this is a little rubber foot, similar to the ones um, on the bottom of the case. Actually a little white rubber foot with uh, like uh, adhesive on the back side of it. I've seen that from factory in several Amiga 600s now. So um, this probably was added because the case, uh, sometimes the keyboard shorted out expansion cards in these and they just added this as a quick fix, quick and dirty fix. That is so Commodore. <laughs> Another thing that several people pointed out actually um, is that I was, I was mentioning that the top part of the RF shielding that is usually covering the whole circuit board. I thought that it was because um, somebody put the CF card in and just left out the um, shielding because it is just uh, basically just preventing airflow basically it's not really necessary for um, using the machine at all. Um, it seems like they sold a lot of these without the shield in place. So the bottom shield is there because that also covers um, the holes in the back where the connectors are and gives it a rigidity. But this was probably from factory came without the top shielding. So I'll have to remove the memory expansion. To do that, I'm just going to. Ah, this is all a bit wonky. This has a broken off piece, uh, but that that's not my fault. That came like this. You can basically remove this by just pulling it out. This is the memory expansion. I think it has uh, broken memory chips on here. Some of these are broken, or at least one of them isn't even recognized by the system. I'm going to have a look at this at some point. Um, yeah, also we'll, I'm going to have to remove two screws that hold the drive bracket, which is another metal bracket in place to remove the circuit board. So the drive should come out now. Oh, there's actually another screw on top here. <laughs> that also, that doubles as holding the circuit board in. Okay, there we go. Thankfully, I think we don't have to take the metal uh, shield off of this. We just have to remove this screw. I think that should be it. Is it loose now? Yeah, it is. And we have to, of course, we have to remove, in this case, we have to remove the switch from the side here. A 
And this machine is another one of the Commodores where we have to angle the circuit board at a weird angle to get it out, actually. Uh, mostly we have to get these out here, the joystick ports and mouse ports in this case, and then you can take it off. Okay, and because somebody complained about this in the one of the last videos, actually in the comments section, I'm just putting the screws away from my tidy workspace here. We are going to have to remove the keyboard from the top part here, which is just clipped in, I think. Yes, it is indeed. There we go. Nice little keyboard. And we're also going to have to remove this little LED assembly. It's just literally, it's just three LEDs and three resistors for the LEDs. Um, yeah. My particular one had a broken trace, so I patched it up <laughs> and uh, made it work again. So now that I have freed the case parts from all the electronic components, um, you can see that these are slightly yellowed, actually the, the top part at least is slightly yellowed. This is the original color actually. So you can see the original color of the case here on the badge. Um, this is slightly yellowed. They are nearly white originally, other than the other former Amigas, which are rather beige in comparison. This is uh, the Amiga 600 and the Amiga 1200 are nearly completely white in color. So this is slightly yellowed. I'm just going to clean this up and give it a bit of a retro bite if necessary. Sometimes the yellowing just uh, turns out to be dirt and just cleans off. And in this case, I think it is slightly yellowed. Actually, we need some retro writing on this. So for the bottom part, I don't think I need to retrovite this. This doesn't seem to have discoloration at all, not even on the sides. Uh, this is like, yeah, you can probably see the difference here. This is the original color and this is slightly yellowed. So I'm just going to give this all the plastic parts, this included, a little bath in some soapy water and scrub them thoroughly. I'm not going to remove any of the um, stickers or feet. Some people, I saw people doing this, but in my experience they, they don't. It, it just works. You don't need to remove these uh, if you are careful. Not you, you don't want to scrub on these too hard or anything like that, but you don't have to remove them uh, while cleaning and you don't have to remove them while retro writing. So it's going to work. Same for the rubber feet. Sometimes they get uh, sometimes they are deteriorated to an extent where they're just a gooey mess, basically. But in this case, they seem pretty sturdy and usually you can just um, wipe off the dirt with some soap and they're going to be fine. I'm also going to remove all the keycaps because I need to clean those too. Always a good idea to clean stuff before retro writing. And I'm going to use my trusty keycap puller for that job, which is just uh, kind of a wire contraption. Uh, you can probably build something like this yourself. Just grabs the keys and pulls on two sides of it evenly which makes things so much easier. And I'm just going to use two containers, one for the actual keycaps and the other one for the springs that you find underneath the keys. There's also some metal brackets for the large keys. I think on this one it's uh, on the spacebar and on the enter key actually, or the return key rather. Uh, 
yeah, just going to do this in time lapse because it usually takes quite a while and I don't want you to sit through this. special thing about the spacebar, it has, for one, it has one of these uh, little bracket things, it's the metal bracket thing, that is just clipped in into the spacebar here and it also clips in, in some hinges on the keyboard assembly. And this has actually has two different types of springs. So these smaller ones are on the sides here and this is the one uh, above the actual plunger that closes the contacts on the keyboard membrane. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, and apart from the space bar, we also have one of these uh, wires brackets on the tab key and on the return key, as I suspected. Uh, the other keys don't have these brackets. So this keyboard assembly is not, not that dirty, I'm just going to give it a quick wipe and I think I can get away with not taking this apart just by brushing it off and using some IPA. You don't want to use any uh, thing that doesn't evaporate completely because you might damage the keyboard membrane underneath and uh, destroy the contacts because they are just printed on there. It's basically just uh, carbon printed on the circuit board or on the membrane in this case. It's just it's a really flimsy construction so if you get any, any solvent in there that destroys the carbon contacts you're going to regret it basically. But uh, with alcohol basically this uh, just remains on the surface and the membrane is going to be fine. This cleaned up rather nicely. So we're not going to have to take this apart, which is good because there's a lot of screws. <laughs> so wise man that I am, I already put this into a container that I can just pour some soapy water in and soak these keys. And for the springs and the other metal parts, I'm not going to do anything because these are not rusted or anything. I've seen people using WD-40 on these. Um, I've done that before. In this case they look like factory fresh apart from some dust. But I'm not too worried about that so I'm just going to leave them as is. These go into soapy water. Just using lukewarm water for this, so the plastic won't melt. Don't go any warmer than 60 degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, and just this, like hand warm water, usually does the job fine. So I'm just going to let the case parts soak for an hour or something, and then I'm going to brush them and, uh, yeah, clean them. <laughs>
So as you can see, this already turned out rather nicely. There's a couple of um, little black, I don't know, scuff marks that I'm going to address uh, with a magic eraser kind of thing, which is the mild abrasive thing. Uh, but otherwise it looks good. It needs some slight retro writing. The bottom part also has some scratches and some black marks on here, which I don't really mind that much. It's a bit scratched around the little um, trapdoor thing here. Uh, but it's the underside of the machine, so uh, the color is pretty much original, so I'm not going to do any retro writing on this. So I now have one of the magic eraser thingies here, and it just slightly wetted, wetted, is that word? Wetted it. What it does is, um, yeah, it works really well on stuff like this. It's just a mild abrasive uh, kind of surface, and as you can see, or maybe you can't because it's too small on screen. Uh, the little scuff mark here is already gone. I'm going to do the same with the ones here. Probably this is going to work very well. Yes, it does. You don't want to do this too much because it actually uh, scratches the surface, obviously, because it's abrasive. But only ever so slightly. So that's usually the last thing I do concerning cleaning these cases. This works really well, so let's do the bottom part too. <laughs> and it's just a bit of water, so you can see, you probably see, there's a lot, like a red or orange mark and a black one. Let's see if we can get rid of those. So the red one's already nearly gone. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Magic indeed. <laughs> so we are going to retrobrite this piece at least and the keycaps uh, because they are slightly yellowed. I think they're going to turn out uh, as good as new in the end of this process, hopefully. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my uh, retro writing box, which is just a cardboard box that says Microsoft authorized refurbisher, <laughs> uh, as a joke, basically. Um, and it has some aluminum or aluminum foil inside to reflect the light. Uh, that is used for retro brighting, which in my case comes from this uh, 300 watt LED grow light, which is like a plant light. This particular one is no longer available, uh, I think. It has like uh, blue and pink LEDs in it, basically. It's supposedly a full spectrum light. Uh, it produces quite a lot of heat which probably helps with the retro brighting process. Uh, we are going to use a cream peroxide for retro brighting. This is liquid stuff and this is the cream stuff that I use. I've used this, this is the first thing basically that I found uh, when I was looking for cream peroxide. This is stuff that is usually used for uh, bleaching hair. This is literally stuff from uh, hairdressers use on hair. I've, I've used this from the very beginning. I started retro brighting things and it has served me well so I just uh, stayed with this. Um, the liquid stuff I'm going to use for the keycaps and yeah this is only half full. I'm probably going to have to uh, put some water, mix it with water, which usually is not a problem, at least if you don't have a lot of yellowing going on. So you definitely want to wear gloves for this um, because the peroxide cream can give you some nasty skin irritation and sort of burns your skin. So you, you, you won't die, <laughs> but it's not a pleasant experience. Let me tell you that. I've uh, been there before because I was too impatient and touched stuff with my bare hands. So I'm using these fancy black gloves. 
So what I'm going to do is to coat this piece, at least the top part of it, the inner part we don't really need to retrobrite. I'm going to coat the top part evenly using a paintbrush with our cream peroxide, which is this one. Yeah. And uh, then wrap it like in cling wrap uh, foil that you would use in the kitchen. It's actually the foil that I, <laughs> I actually took that from the kitchen because I'm out of uh, foil that I had for this purpose. And then I'm going to put it in the box, put my little grow light on top here, turn it on. And every half an hour I'm going to go in and uh, slightly massage the cream on the plastics around so it doesn't give me uh, streaking or discoloration and uh, makes it an even retrobrite. I'm not really sure if it's... people reported that they are they are fine without that step but I usually do that uh, to make sure that the pieces are evenly retrobrited. So yeah, that's how I do it. I'm just going to stop talking and actually do it. The cling wrap is to prevent it from drying, basically. I've also seen people having good results without it. I always did it with cling wrap. In my experience, this works really well. Let's see if it works this time. <laughs> For the keycaps, I'm just going to use the liquid stuff and just uh, pour it in here, basically. Which, of course, you want to make sure to not get anything in your eyes or anything like that. I'm just going to follow this up with some water, I think. Look at that. That might be pretty much it. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. That's well, pretty much de yellowed. Very nice. I think the keys need some more treatment here. Uh, they are definitely better, but they need some more time. Yeah, some of them are still pretty yellow. I'm going to put these into uh, my special key container. <laughs> so there's, I have another insulated container that has like aluminum coated bubble wrap around it. 
So here's a sad container I was talking about. And as it so happens, this just fits in there. And our light just fits on top. And this is going to heat up the inside just below 60 degrees Celsius, which is uh, a temperature where the ABS plastics of the keycaps doesn't melt, which is kind of great. So we are going to do the same thing uh, with the keycaps for another half an hour or so, or maybe an hour or two, and uh, come in and shake and stir them every half an hour. And we're going to wash the uh, top part of the case, because that's done. That's back to nearly white. So another two hours later, uh, this should be it really, I think. And uh, yeah, they are nearly white, as I said, not quite white, obviously. It's, it's like an off-white, but much brighter than the old Amigas. Yeah, so let me just uh, pour this out. Uh, this stuff is actually reusable, so I'm going to uh, pour it back into the bottle and see if I can get another use out of it <laughs> for retrowriting more keys from another system. So, um, yeah. Usually... At least lose a bit of the liquid during this. But hey, this wasn't too bad, actually. Yeah, these turned out really nicely. So I'm just going to leave these to dry. Uh, usually takes a couple of hours. And then... I'm going to reassemble the keyboard. So the keys turned out really nicely. Uh, I'm just using my Amiga 1200 keyboard as a reference to get the correct posi positions for these uh, keys. I'm going to start with the space bar, I think. Some of the gray keys, so the darker keys, have some strange kind of slight discoloration. Uh, but otherwise, this turned out really nicely. This is going this way, I think. Yes, it is. Here's a close-up of the strange discoloration issue I have. Um, the, the darker keys turned out a bit brighter than their original color. I think that's normal with... Uh, ones that have been uh, used in the sun basically and were yellowed so you get a little bit brighter. The yellow basically becomes the brighter gray, um, brighter than the original gray. And there's a little spot where it is like darker, it looks like a, a drop or something. I don't know how this happened and it happened actually happened on a couple of keys, uh, just the same shape. So it's just, uh, just the same on the uh, second Amiga key. And I think also, yeah, the control key here also has a little... The same spot. I have no idea how this happened. Maybe, maybe there was like a marker on there. That would be an explanation. Uh, Amiga Amiga control is like the reset. I guess maybe somebody uh, put some... Yeah, I don't know some marking on there for, for another person to know where the reset is. Uh, and that shows now. It didn't show with the uh, in the original state I got this in, but it shows now. It looks like somebody just put a little dot there or something. Otherwise the keys turn out really nicely, I think. Uh, no issues whatsoever. I've used this method now a couple of times. 
and yeah, it has proven to be quite reliable as long as you have uh, bright keys. For dark keys, uh, I won't recommend retro brighting them at all. Uh, I had some very mixed experiences with that, actually. Putting these back together is always as rewarding as it is. It's always kind of a challenge. Uh, not very fond of it. Very fond of the end result, though. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, just use something to put those brackets into position and you're going to be fine, basically. So the keyboards are actually quite different after all. So we have um, this, of, co of course, the arrow keys are in this position here instead of the position here on the Amiga 1200. We also have different sizes uh, for the top row of keys here. I think the, the escape key is uh, one size with the function keys, whereas on the Amiga 1200 it's a smaller key. So they are not interchangeable for these more special keys. They are for the standard keyboard, I think, but um, the function keys and things like that are a bit differently layouted and are not all interchangeable. At least the escape key is different and the arrow keys are a different color at least. Uh, things like that. Interesting. Ta-da! One peculiar thing is that there's the uh, like the backspace and the delete key just being next to each other. Uh, there's a little space for the LED strip thing. Otherwise, yeah, we have these little markings where somebody... Obviously, this is like what you do to reset the Amiga. Amiga Amiga control is like... Uh, yeah. And somebody marked that, obviously, with little dots on the keys, and that uh, some chemical reaction led to these little darker spots. But otherwise, it's uh, pristine, looks really good, turned out really nicely. As you can probably see, uh, the case itself also turned out the exact original colors, so there's no, there's no difference to the uh, bottom case anymore. So this is... Uh, you can also see it here, the, the little um, sticker is the same color as the case now. Nearly white, the inside is the same color as the outside, so this turned out really well. All these cases, as many of the Commodore cases, have the problem that, in this case on the bottom, uh, they have these little hinges that tend to break off, and these Amiga 600s have hinges on the sides here, and little hinges on the back. And I can see the, the two middle, middle ones here are okay. These two ones are broken off. This one is broken off. This one is all right, actually. Uh, thankfully, I have something to remedy that. You may remember the C64 case saver kit that Jeff Bird made, uh, or still makes, and sells on his website. I'm going to link his channel in. And he also makes kind of the same approach stuff for the Amiga 600 now. Um, these are the little replacement hinges for the sides and these are the ones for the back. So here's one of the original ones on the back that's still intact and it looks uh, good actually. This one also looks good. This one is broken off. So the new one actually just goes in here like this. And it obviously fits perfectly. So um, this larger area here is going to replace the hinges, the little flimsy hinges. What you do, you rough up the surface, you clean the surface with some alcohol. You can also put some alcohol on the 3D printed part. And then you epoxy it in place, basically. And you're good to go. So for the side hinges, these look like this. I don't know, it's pretty difficult to film. 
um, there's a little hinge there and on the other side is broken off here's the one on the other side that's broken off and we're going to have to file that down to the height of this little uh, cutout here so we can use the replacement hinge which then slides on here like like so but we have to um, cut this down first i think i'm going to use my side cutters for that actually and then this slides over the the stump <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, for sending these. If you want these, uh, Jeff sells them through his web shop. Um, linked in the video description. <laughs> and also, Jeff makes beautiful YouTube videos about retro computers too, so uh, check out his channel as well. Kind of feels wrong. <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do. I'm also roughing up the, the areas where I want to put the epoxy, as I said. So the epoxy has something to stick to. It's always a good idea to just uh, can put some scratches in there, file, roughen up the surface a bit. As usual, I'm mixing up a bit much. <laughs> and you don't need much of this stuff because this holds really well. Okay, I'm just going to let this settle for a bit. And these, yeah, these should stay into position without any issues. Uh, the one on the side, I just clamped down a bit, so it is going to uh, set in the correct orientation and or correct position there. So yeah, that's basically the Amiga 600 case saver kit. Okay, this should be fully dry now. Yeah, and it, yes, it is completely dry. Like I said, this is like five minutes uh, curing epoxy for model making and things like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, this just works beautifully. So um, what I'm going to do is to put the circuit board back in here and put the keyboard back into the top half of the case and see how that looks all together. Reassembly time! <laughs> so, okay, let's put the, the actual circuit board back in. So I looked for a better switch for this and I don't really have a better one, so this is going to have to do for now. Which is kind of a shame, but yeah, I'm going to go in there at a later point and replace it with something more proper. Not really fond of this uh, Kickstart switcher mod, but I'm going to leave it in for now and I'm going to find a better switch. This is like a center position that basically switches off all the ROMs, which doesn't make sense because it doesn't. the machine won't start up without a Kickstart ROM. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of useless. It works in the uh, front and back positions, so that's good. Oh, look at that. There might actually be a problem with this disk drive and the case savers. Hmm. So the problem is that this case saver part is protruding too much in this direction, so we have to cut it down. Yeah, this is not going to work because the case saver... So this disk drive should pretty much be sitting where the uh, original thing is and down. So it can't go down because of the case saver there. That's kind of a bummer. We need to cut this whole part here.
So I pretty much leveled it out with the rest of the, with the remainder of the old uh, hinge there. And we still have the new hinge uh, grouping into the case, so it should be perfect, probably, hopefully. Okay, trying the disk drive. Yes. Now it fits. Okay. So this time for real, I'm going to assemble this. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> okay, so this looks as good as new. This is really cool. Yeah, I'm always kind of overwhelmed by how well retro brighting works, if it works right, which it mostly does for me after doing it a couple of times. Um, yeah, this just looks like uh, it came right out of the box. This looks really mint. And Retro writing, there's the thing is, it is going to start yellowing again after some time. Uh, as far as I've seen, and as far as my experience, it doesn't get back to a point of yellowing as it was before you retro brighted it. So it, it gets better, it gets brighter still, even if it re yellows a bit after time. Um, sometimes it just stays like this. I don't, I don't know what the uh, what the thing is, some of the machines I retro write just stay white. Uh, some of them start slightly re-yellowing slowly after a year or so it starts and slowly progresses until they reach uh, another, like a state of yellowing, which is usually much less yellow than what they started out as. So it makes sense. And even if it, if it's only for this moment that I have Every time, basically, I do it, um, where I just marvel at the beauty of a machine that looks like it came fresh out of the factory. So, for me, this is so worth it. Yeah, and all the hinges seem to grip fine again. Uh, not going to put the screws back in yet. Yeah, this is really nice. Um, I'm not going to put the screws back in yet because I want to put a hard disk in this, or like uh, an SD card, rather. <laughs> really cool. Okay, this looks so good. Yeah, so as for the hard disk, I just ordered a random uh, SD to small 44 pin, I think, IDE uh, card from somebody that sold a little cable with it, actually. I'm just going to plug the cable in. This should be pin one. There's a little pin one marking on here. This should go on here. This is pretty nice and compact. So I have a similar thing with the CF card in my Amiga 1200. I thought I'd just try this with a with an SD card reader. For a change because allegedly these might be a bit faster even. Um, I don't know, I have no experience whatsoever with these, so <laughs> uh, your guess is as good as mine. I'm just going to put the, the bracket in here because it supports the keyboard a bit and it should fit nicely with this in place as well. I'm just going to, to have it like this, I guess, because uh, I don't have an accelerator yet. I'm just going to put some more gaffer's tape on here uh, to have some insulation. Okay, there we go. It should be nicely insulated. Just going to leave it as is for now because I just want to see if it works at all. At first, obviously. <laughs> uh, I actually have to make some Workbench 3.1 discs from extras, from uh, ADF files I have on the hard disk, uh, because I don't have it on disk. I didn't install it from disk yet. <laughs> 
but fortunately I have some empty uh, three and a half inch double density discs that I can use for this purpose. And I also made a whole video about um, transferring files and disk files from Amigas to disks and back and forth uh, recently. I'm going to link that in the corner there if you are interested. So the good news is I managed to make some installation disks for Workbench 3.1 and the Amiga 600 still works actually, which is nice. <laughs> uh, put it into 3.1 ROM mode and now I'm booting the install disk for Workbench 3.1. The hard disk LED is on all the time, so I don't know if that's uh, supposed to be the case, I don't think so. Probably there's something wrong with our adapter or our cable. But yeah, we're going to see. Let's see if the hard disk shows up in our HD toolbox. But it probably won't. Something's wrong there. Oh, there we go. So this is actually reading high speed SD. I have to support, I have to. Um, make a new definition for the drive type, it seems. Oh, I have to unprotect the disk because it is saving some stuff to the disk, it seems. There we go, now we have a new drive type. Are you sure you want to change the drive type for the current drive? Yes, I do. So now we should be able to partition the drive correctly, I guess. Two partitions with 120 meg. I just want one. Yeah, now it shows 240 meg. That's cool. And I want this to be TH0 because that's the standard name basically. Commit to changes. This operation will destroy the data in following partitions. Yay! A reboot is required to make your changes take effect. Select continue to reboot. Select cancel to go back to the program. Let's reboot. And see if that actually changed our drive. So here's the thing. This uh, actually lights up permanently, which isn't nice. But other than that, this seems to work, actually. Hmm, it does work, so my hard disk just shows up. I probably can format this now. Uh, format disk. Should be SD Amiga SD. <laughs> International mode, yeah, let's just do this. And just choose quick format, I guess. 240 megabytes. This is like a pretty decent uh, size hard disk drive, I suppose. Yeah, there we go. Can now install the workbench. That wasn't too bad. We just had to define a new drive type. That was uh, the whole secret to this. But for now, I'm just going to go through the installation process. Yeah, I'm not going to bore you with the installation process. It's pretty pretty straightforward. You're just going to be asked to uh, insert the correct disk at the correct time and things like that. And uh, we're going to have a hard disk install of the system pretty soon, I think. I hope. So you could actually put a larger hard disk in here or SD card, not hard disk. Um, 3.1 supports partitions up to four gigabytes, I believe, out of the box. And uh, with some tricks, it supports larger partitions too. But you have to have a boot partition that is uh, four gigabytes or smaller. Uh, I think that 240 megabytes that we have now are um, decent size for an Amiga hard disk, especially since this doesn't have an accelerator or a memory expansion in it. It's just basically uh, going to be used for now as a stock Amiga system uh, with the 3.1 system on there and uh, switchable to uh, 1.3 for 
downwards, backwards compatibility, so I can play older games on this too, which is pretty nice. Uh, I really like the little small form factor of this. And I kind of enjoy this process of just <laughs> installing an Amiga that isn't accelerated, that has a real uh, floppy disk drive. It just looks like a new Amiga. The mouse is my old mouse. Uh, it's not new, <laughs> as you can probably see. <laughs> Apparently we're done with the installation and it says uh, we must reboot now. This should be, if everything worked, uh, should be the first boot from hard disk for this system. Let's see if it actually worked. It should be pretty quick. I guess, I hope. Let's see if it actually boots from hard disk. Yes, it does. Really nice. Okay, so that worked. And we have a pretty snappy hard disk, actually. This uh, seems to react pretty quickly. Hmm. I like that. So and as, as is kind of tradition with this video, so I'm just going to end it uh, with some Tarikin 2, <laughs> which I kind of always play as a test game on my Amigas whenever I have uh, an Amiga refurbished or anything. I think this turned out pretty nicely. I still have to find a workaround for the LED that is like permanently lit for the hard disk. I don't know what the issue is, but I had a similar issue uh, with it not being lit at all uh, with my Amiga 1200 initially. So maybe there's a workaround for that. I'll have to look that up. I think it's just a wiring problem in the um, little SD card adapter there. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope this was an informative thing, even though I didn't really do much uh, technical stuff. but. This is how I usually go about with a restoration of these things and I did the technical stuff on this before. So more videos about this to come. Probably there's probably some more uh, expansions I want to put in this. I still have to take a look at the uh, memory expansion for this, which doesn't work at all. It doesn't show up in the system at all. Uh, yeah, special thanks to my supporters. There's a whole lot of new supporters at the moment and I'm so thankful for that because, uh, yeah, as you probably know, I lost my job due to the Corona crisis and uh, now I'm living off of uh, making videos and doing live streams on Twitch occasionally. If you're interested in that stuff, it's linked below. <laughs> I uh, usually stream from the hardware I repaired on this channel, uh, mostly once a week. And yeah. Thank you so much for watching, thanks for your support. If you like this, please consider subscribing to this channel or even becoming a supporter. And yeah, thank you very much, see you all soon. I'm Jan Beta, thanks for watching, see you next time, bye. I don't even have a joystick connected, how am I supposed to play this game? <laughs>